The great dying at the end of the Permian period would be the end of an era, quite literally. It brings to the end the geologic era known as the Paleozoic era and brings us to the beginning of the Mesozoic era, which includes the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. During these three periods that we'll start by talking about today in this video, we would see the rise of the reptiles, which would dominate the air, the land, and the sea, and would see some of the largest terrestrial animals to ever walk the planet Earth. It all starts now as the Earth recovers from the Permian mass extinction in the beginning of the Triassic, so stay tuned. The Great Dying at the end of the Permian period wiped out about 97% of all aquatic species as well as 70% of terrestrial species. And as a result, the effect was that most of the Earth actually lacked multicellular life. Now, during the beginning of the Triassic period, the period that follows the Permian and the first of the Mesozoic era, we would see life begin to recover from the Great Dying. But a lot of things are going to change, and the main reason has to do with the fact that the Earth itself has changed. The Earth has now existed mainly in the form of a single supercontinent known as Pangaea for the bulk of the last two periods. But by the end of the Triassic, we're going to start to see Pangaea start to fall apart, and that again is going to have a vast impact on life. And if we look at what the Earth looked like during the Triassic, much like the Permian, the Triassic was a drier period. And if we look at what Pangaea looked like, the majority of Pangaea was, was a large arid desert. But the coastlines were more habitable, as well as the polar regions, which were also moist and habitable. So life began to recover in the oceans as well as in these habitable portions of Pangaea during the beginning of the Triassic. But life during the Triassic would be different than that of the Permian. First, when we look at the oceans, we look at many of the marine species, such as mollusks and brachiopods. These species were decimated during the Permian mass extinction, during the Great Dying, and they would take their time to recover over several millions of years. Fish species in the ocean were also remarkably uniform, testifying to the fact that the majority of fish genera have been completely wiped out during the Great Dying, and what was left to restock the oceans came from a few groups that managed to somehow survive. Life on land was also affected. Amphibians, which had been, uh, a, a, which had been a major component of most ecosystems right up to the end of the Permian, really suffered greatly. And those that survived, survived in aquatic habitats. There were very few uh, land-based niches where amphibians were the dominant species. And instead, it would be the reptiles that would inherit the majority of the terrestrial Earth. When we look at the most predominant reptilian groups that exist during the early Triassic, we're going to see that they're divided mostly into herbivores and into carnivores. When we look at the herbivores, we're going to see, and they're all the dominant species, by the way, are all going to be species of archosaur. Uh, when we look at the archosaurian uh, herbivores, we're going to see two major groups, the rhynchosaurs and the edosaurs. Uh, and both of these groups would form the, the major component of the herbivorous species that were inhabiting the Triassic forests. They, of course, would be hunted down uh, by the carnivorous or the predatory, uh, the predatory archosaurs that were around at this time. The two major predator groups of reptiles were the pseudosuchians, which would give rise to all modern day crocodilians uh, when they split towards the end of the Triassic, and the phytosaurs. And the phytosaurs uh, would uh, also be around for the majority of the Triassic. Now, the Pseudosuchians, like I said, would split towards the end of the Triassic. One group of them would actually uh, die off and go extinct during the end Triassic mass extinction. Spoiler alert, there's going to be another mass extinction. And the other group would go on to give rise to all modern crocodilian species that we still have around today. So when people say that crocodiles are basically dinosaurs, they're wrong, but not that wrong. They've been around for a very long time. At least their ancestors have been around for several hundreds of millions of years. Of course, other reptilian species begin to appear in the, tri in the Triassic as well. Uh, we see the first groups of Testudines appear. So Testudines, uh, they're modern descendants, uh, they're the ancestors, I should say, of modern turtles and tortoises. So they show up for the first time uh, during the Triassic. Uh, we also start to see 
uh, a group of, of, of reptile, reptiles known as the Sphenodonts. And while the Sphenodonts were actually quite prominent during the Mesozoic era, uh, they would largely go extinct. And the only remaining group is a uh, reptilian species known as the Tawateras, which exist on the, uh, the island of New Zealand. So they're the last remaining group of this, this particular reptilian group of species that first appeared during the Triassic. The other group we're going to see uh, appear uh, in the reptile lineage are the theropods. And theropods are going to be very important moving forward because the theropods uh, really begin to appear during the end of the Triassic. And it's the theropods that are going to give rise to almost every, they're going to give rise to the dinosaurs. Um, and we know that the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods that are about to follow are dominated by dinosaurs on land. Well, the theropods first appeared during the Triassic, but what's interesting is they're largely uh, going to be a group of small reptiles that play no major role in most ecosystems. It isn't until after the end Triassic mass extinction that the theropods are going to rise and dominate terrestrial Earth for the next 150 million years or so. The other major group of reptiles that we see around are these strange species known as the cynodonts. Uh, and they are strange in the fact that they actually have hair. What's interesting about the, the, the cynodonts is these are the groups, uh, this is the major group that's going to give rise to the first true mammals towards the end of the Triassic. They are our ancestors. And uh, while they do play a fairly major role in Triassic ecosystems, by the end of the period, they're actually going to be fairly, they're, they're mammalian relatives at least. Uh, the cynodonts will actually go extinct, but their mammalian ancestors or mammalian descendants, I should say, would remain around. They would be largely uh, small bodied and pr play a, pr a fairly minor role in most ecosystems for the next two geologic periods. And it wouldn't be until after the Cretaceous mass extinction that the mammals would rise to prominence in many terrestrial ecosystems. Now, as I said before, uh, amphibians would be greatly reduced in terms of both the number of species as well as their prominence in most in most ecosystems. Uh, one thing to note about amphibians that actually do happen is we see with uh, we see during the Triassic, um, we actually see the appearance mm -hmm. of the first Lys amphibia, which is uh, a group of reptile or amphibians. I'm sorry that would go on to give rise to all modern frogs. So they first uh, and salamanders. So they first appeared during the Triassic period. So this is where frogs basically come from. Uh, is is an evolutionary event that happened during the Triassic. Now reptiles would also go on to dominate the sea. Uh, the majority of fish species were obliterated during the mass extinction. Uh, as were most aquatic species at this point. And some reptiles actually began to migrate back into the water. When we look in the ocean, the apex predators are largely going to be uh, reptilian in nature. So we're going to see the first uh, major groups. Uh, we're going to see plesiosaurs and pleosaurs. Uh, we're going to see sauropsids um, and, and, and other uh, large-bodied reptilian predators roaming around the oceans, representing the dominant species at this particular time. The fish would take a long time to recover. Uh, and again, the oceans as well as the air are going to be dominated by reptiles as well as the land. When we look in the air, uh, we need to recognize that for the past several million years, the only species that have been able to fly are arthropods. They're the only group of species, the insects, to actually develop flight. But during the Triassic, we're going to see the first tetrapods, the first vertebrates, actually gain the ability to fly. This is going to be in the form of pterosaurs. So the pterosaurs are actually broken down into two major groups. Uh, the pterosaurs and then the non -tera in uh, so the pterodactyl like pterosaurs and the non pterodactyl like pterosaurs. The non pterodactyl like ones are going to have skin wings that actually connect both their arms and their legs. So the skin wings would stretch across all four limbs, uh, sort of giving like a glider like appearance. Um, they did have powered flight though. Um, on land, they would have had a hard time walking because of their attached limbs. The pterodactyl pterosaurs those are going to be ones that have wings that just extend from their arms to their body so their legs are free and they were much more mobile on land most evidence suggests that pterosaurs regardless of which group they belong to were uh, largely uh, piscivores which means they actually ate fish they were predominantly looking at eating things from the ocean nevertheless there were some very fearsome looking predators could be massive in size uh, and they were these the first tetrapods to develop powered flight um, and uh, would dominate the air for the next several hundred million years during the Triassic, the Jurassic, and well into the Cretaceous periods. Now, I know we're starting to sense a trend with a lot of these 
a lot of these periods, and they tend to be defined by a mass extinction event, and the Triassic is no exception. The Triassic would end with the fourth major mass extinction event in Earth's history. Uh, this was probably the result of the Earth changing geologic activity. By the time we reach the end of the Triassic, Pangaea, which has existed for a super as a supercontinent since the end of the Carboniferous, uh, would start to fall apart. Um, we're not going to see a lot of change in terms of the shape of, of the supercontinent at this point. We start to see the first major movements during the early to mid Jurassic period coming up next. But there's a significant amount of evidence that the geologic activity that underpinned that particular movement of the continents started to have an effect towards the end of the Triassic. And what we think happened is the, this geologic activity contributed to a massive amount of uh, volcanic activity uh, that led to uh, changes in the, in the climate of the planet that led to the fourth major mass extinction. Just like we see in many other mass extinctions, sea life would be, would be very hard hit uh, by this particular change in, in, in the ecosystem or in the uh the weather of the planet of the climate of the planet we would also see many of the large bodied species that have developed on land over the triassic period start to go away so any of the remaining large bodied amphibians are going to go away many of the large bodied reptiles are going to start to appear including uh many of uh the non archos uh, non -ar many of these large bodied archosaurs as well as many of the uh many of these cynodonts uh would go away now, this is going to be very important because as these large bodied species go away, they're going to be replaced in the Jurassic and they're going to be replaced by another group of archosaurs. It's going to be the dinosaurs that appear and roam the earth during the Jurassic and take over most terrestrial biomes. But that's what we'll talk about in the next video. The Jurassic period would end with another mass extinction event. It would wipe out most of the large bodied organisms walking around on land. We'd see the the end of most of the synapsids, so the cynodonts and everything except for the small bodied, warm blooded mammals uh, would be wiped out from the planet Earth. We would see the oceans be very hard hit and we basically see just the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs remain as large bodied carnivorous reptiles in the ocean and the air would still be filled with pterosaurs as we head into the Jurassic. But when we get to the Jurassic period, which is coming up next, we're gonna see a world that truly is dominated by the dinosaurs. So I hope you'll tune in to watch my next video where we talk about what life was like during the Jurassic. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot and I'll see you next time. Bye.